welcome back for a brand new episode of The Witching Hour. You know me, I'm Perry. You know my wonderful co-host, Haley. And I hope you know who Simon Barrett is, because Simon's here celebrating his feature directorial debut. But, I I mean, we're going to be here all day if I start rattling off titles. But I feel like our audience is probably very familiar with, I don't know, let's go with your next and the guest at the very least. Yeah, and there actually, really, uh, is what I usually do. That's so, it. how... How is life right now? How How is it? Wait, now I'm really curious because we were talking about that mask thing pre-rolling. What, what's the mask collection like if you're enjoying, you know, adding that to the uh, the fashion accessories? Oh, I have a bunch of really like nice masks and I have a bunch of really like strong opinions on uh, like masks, uh, mask designers and stuff. I actually, uh, I was up in uh, Toronto earlier this year filming a segment of uh, VHS 94 and like one of the few things I bought there was I bought a bunch of masks because they had really, I, I, I thought they had really cool fashionable masks at like all these boutiques in Canada. They're, they're more in the long haul up there, I think. Um, you see less disposable ones and more like hand knit ones. And, and you know, I, I'm just like, I, I absolutely would go outside with a bucket over my head if I could, which has like, again, nothing to do with like health concerns and everything to do with just like ha- how I feel about the world and people looking at me. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I've got some really, I, I mean, we can get into it later in the show, but yeah, I've got some great, really fashionable masks. And, and as for how everything's doing, that, that pretty much summed it up. Uh, life is surreal for everyone right now. Um, and, you know, my surreal thing is that I have a film coming out. Uh, you're, you're bringing, you're bringing the entertainment to people when they need it most. And the cool thing about seance is it's going to get a little of everything. It's going to be in theaters on demand and digital on May 21st. So as we start to open up and get back out in the world, you have the option of seeing this movie on the big screen, but if you'd rather stay home for a little while longer, or if you're not there yet, then you could watch it at home as well. So giving everybody the best of both worlds. Yeah, which actually is kind of nice because, like, I feel like every time I have a film come out, like, it, it it receives a small enough release that there's like someone in like, you know, Peoria who's just insanely pissed off at me and thinks that like I particularly like avoided their city with like the release of the guest and you know, and the best is also like half those people you're like it already played in your city, it's gone now, it, it was a failure, you, you missed it, um, and those are gratifying messages to send to people. Um, no, I'm actually thrilled that that like it because it, it does have that like hey if you if you if you I I strongly encourage uh, and in fact think it should be legally mandated for every uh, American citizen to see Seance in a theater at least once. Uh, however, um, it is really nice that it's on VOD and anyone can watch at any time and uh, and both versions should look pretty nice. Even though uh, we made this film, we finished this film in a pandemic, and I ultimately had to color grade it on the iPad that I'm talking to you on right now. Yay. Well, yeah, uh, I guess we'll see how people feel about the film. But yeah, but I, I, I think so. Yeah. So I think I think Haley and I wanted to hit a little bit of everything leading up to your feature directorial debut. Haley, you want to take it first? Oh, you, you're curveballing me. Um, sure. I was uh, to prep for this. I was watching some of your chat you did at Fantasia last year, which was very insightful. And I found some of the the things you had to say about like why you were glad you went to film school, but why you wouldn't recommend it necessarily now. Very interesting. So what do you think is like the defining factor on why it's no longer as helpful as it was for you? Uh, yeah, great question. I mean, first of all, I just want to point out that like, I, I, I like that you uh, focused on how useless and inactionable my uh, advice is to people, because I, I always feel like people, you know, uh, it's a strange thing because of course I, I don't feel like I've achieved any, you know, like, like stature of success in my career. I, you know, I don't feel like I have any safety net. I think if, you know, if Seance doesn't do well, you know, I'll, I'll have to pack my bags and hitchhike home. But I know the reality of that is, is not that that's true, that I actually have like, like a, made a few films and that I'm doing fine. Um, and, and so, you know, but I'm always confused when people ask me for advice because it's like, hey man, I'm barely hanging in there. Like, you know, <laughs> you don't want to ask me about anything, um, but, but they do. And, and I think especially because, you know, Adam and I, especially at an early kind of phase of our career, we were pretty forthcoming about, um, 
you know, we were on social media and stuff. And I think we were pretty forthcoming about feeling like we were kind of outsiders, you know, Adam being from Alabama and, and, and myself being from mid Missouri, you know, uh, kind of feeling like we, you know, we would make jokes a lot about how we kind of thought like we were fairly low on the indie horror totem pole, um, so to speak, if that's, I don't know if that's a phrase that has aged well, I'll have to examine that one actually. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, we kind of felt like we were at a low level of things compared to some of our peers. And so whenever I get asked for advice, you know, there's this just kind of like, you know, uh, imposter syndrome moment of just like, why, why, why you don't want to really ask me anything, uh, that, and the film school thing is a pretty good example because I did go to film school. And furthermore, like my connection to having a career now is directly from film school, which is, uh, you know, I wrote a film called Dead Birds because I couldn't figure out how to direct a movie for no money. So whereas writing them was quite cheap, um, I could just do it on my computer at home uh, in my apartment. Uh, I was living in New York at the time with a roommate. And, and so uh, I thought I could make that movie for very cheap, sent it to a friend of mine from film school who was working at a studio. And, you know, there was a lot of convoluted steps to that, but basically that's how that film got financed and made. And on the set of that movie is how I met Adam Wingard and we became friends. And that, then we have, you know, just cause he was making homesick in Alabama at the same time. And so now we have careers and it's like, I have no idea what my path to that would be if there wasn't that film school step. And that's the main reason people go to film school is because they are looking at a road ahead of them. And the, the, you know, the idea on the horizon is this notion of having a career or, you know, a successful, uh, you know, kind of just successful position as an artist, uh, you know, in America. And, and, and it's this, you know, everyone knows it's this very difficult thing to, you know, to actually have a career as a filmmaker. You know, you're extremely unlikely to do it, especially if your parents weren't successful at it themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I think film school is, you know, the thing that most people are going to immediately go to because it feels like there's a structured path that gets you further towards that goal. I think increasingly that's an illusion because of the way films are being made now, it, 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 you know, it's just so different. And, and because of the increased costs of college, um, you know, to me, I just don't see how anyone can justify going to film school, like, and spending their money doing that, as opposed to just taking the same amount of money and trying to make a film which is, you know, the same thing Robert Rodriguez was saying, of course, you know, when I was contemplating going to film school and I was like, well, that's great advice, buddy. You know, you found a way to do that. I don't have any friends. I'm going to film school. So, you know, so, so there's no, the problem is there's no real magic bullet for like film career advice, you know, or screenwriting advice. You know, I, everyone who really, you know, everyone who asks me advice really just wants me to probably say like, like, let me read your script. This is amazing. You know, I'll give this to, you know, Will Smith tomorrow. He'll get it made. It's like, well, you know, I can't, these are not people that I know. Like you know, if I want to get a film, if I want to get my own movies made like Seance, it takes me like, you know, to me like four or five years to find the financing for Seance, which is a fairly small movie, um, quite a small movie by most standards. And, you know, and so, you know, there's always that, that element, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's tricky because career advice is so specific to individual people and what those people can achieve in their individual circumstances that, you know, I tried to just stay away from it. But the film school one is the big one that people are always asking. It's like, hey, here's this huge investment of my money and time. Do you think I should do it? And, you know, the answer is probably not. It seems probably like a bad idea. But if you don't have any other ideas, yeah, it's probably a good idea. And that's, you know, that's what anyone's going to say. I mean, I did not get, I felt like anything out of my film school education other than that connection that indirectly led to me having a successful career and doing this interview right now. So it, it, I feel like a complete hypocrite telling people not to go to film school. And I feel like a lot of filmmakers do this sort of thing too, which is they succeed one route and then they immediately denounce that route. Um, I, I, I'm disinclined to do that, but at the same time, I, I would strongly encourage people, uh, if you are gonna go to film school, just understand that that's not actually gonna give you anything and you still need to be doing all the filmmaking stuff yourself. Because like, you know, it, it, and I'm not mean like it's what you make of it, good, good grades. I don't, obviously, I, I, I'm incapable of that myself. I just mean like you need to make movies also because film school is not going to teach you how to do that. And so as someone who went to film school, that's probably one of the most realistic answers that I've heard about the whole process. Because 
<laughs> it can teeter one way or the other. And I don't know, it, it almost feels like a toss up. And especially when you bring up the rise of costs of those programs now, especially during a time where, you know, in some senses, it does seem like the cost of making a movie could go down if you know what directions to turn in and what resources to use. The costs of making a film have absolutely gone down in my lifetime because, you know, at, at the time that I started making movies, everything was still essentially shot on film. And the complexity and cost of just shooting on film uh, alone, you know, is, is when you get to the micro budget level, you know, very prohibitive. Obviously filmmakers have done it, uh, you know, primer films like that, but they're like, you know, I don't really know how to like create a Bull X camera out of my own hands. So I wouldn't be one of those people that can make that affordable. You know, just the fact that we have, you know, the, the, the camera technology, you know, in our hands now to, to make, you know, these movies is so different from when I was growing up. And, you know, that's just something that's been commented on a lot. I don't, I don't know that I have anything really new to say to that conversation. You know, it's, it's the, it's, it's, you know, it's, it depends on your route and it depends on the film school too. I went to, you know, a film school that was not in Los Angeles, you know, but maybe if I went to USC or, or AFI or NYU or one of these, you know, elite schools, I'd have had a different experience. I suspect I'd just be a lot more broke and a lot more resentful, but you know, it, it's, I, it, who's, to, who's to say, I mean, I work with a lot of people who went to these schools, you know, so somehow that did get them a position in the film industry, which felt like something that was not, you know, instantly attainable to me. So, you know, there's something, there might be something there, but also, you know, but it's, it's a, uh, but I mean, these schools cost this, they, they have to compete with one another. So like, we know that like all these colleges have like billions and like savings and, and weird, weird amounts, like, like, you know, stockpiled, but they all, none of them can start charging less than the others because then that makes them look worse, I think. So it's this escalation where like, you know, Columbia University can't charge that much less than like NYU because that's their brand. It's like Rembrandt toothpaste in the eighties. It's like, it's like seven dollars for a tiny little tube. It must do something, but it, it probably doesn't. It makes absolutely no sense when you phrase it that way, and that's probably very accurate. You did carve your own path, though, and from my limited perspective, it seems like you are doing wonderful things and have uh, your feet on solid ground right now. But going back to what you mentioned about first meeting Adam, when you met him on that set, what was the thing that made you say, like, like this guy, like? We're in line. We have similar creative sensibilities and we got to stick together. There's somewhat of a simple answer to that question, which is, um, and it's ironic now because we're working on Face Off too, but it was talking about John Woo. Um, you know, again, this was 2003 and, you know, it, it's not like John Woo wasn't a tremendously known factor. He'd already, for, for example, done Face Off and, uh, and a few other films. Um, I think Paycheck was, was right behind him. And, um, you know, but, but uh, it, you know, kind of talking when I first met Adam Wingard, it was with a friend of ours, also uh, Evan, uh, Evan E.L. Katz. The two of them were on, came to the set of Dead Birds to do an article for Fangoria about Dead Birds. But they were also directing their own horror movie, uh, or Adam was directing, Evan was a writer of Homesick, which they were shooting on 16 millimeter while we were shooting Dead Birds on 35. So we were the big production, which was like the last time I was the big production in a town. Um, and, and so, but it was really, they came to set, you know, and, you know, with Fangoria, the way you used to do this back in the day, and probably, probably it's still maybe done this way, but if you knew you were getting a set visit from Fangoria, you'd say, you'd schedule it for your big gore set piece, right? So then they could say, oh, this movie's crazy. Um, you know, this is like Bride of Reanimator meets, you know, times a million, you know, and, and, you know, show you the one gore shot from the movie, which it turns out isn't in the movie. And then you see the film and you're like, oh, that that's, doesn't that look terrible. And, and uh, you know, and this was like a very, you know, this, this really set things off with Adam on, on the right way because, you know, it was just awful. It was cold. It was, you know, we're sitting out of the monitor waiting for this gore effect to work. And then, you know, it's like four in the morning and this poor woman is lying there. I think her name is Donna Brazil, this actor. And, and, um, and this like prosthetic kind of like lurches out of this fake body that we built for her. And it looked absolute rubbish. It looked so bad. And, and like the director, Alex Turner, just kind of sighed and walked back to set. And I was just like, there it was, this is Fangoria. And they were just like, well, how long is it gonna take them to do like another one? I was like, oh, it's gonna take a long time. And so we just ended up like ch chatting because you know setting up the effect took so long. And we started talking about John Woo and, and just kind of what our favorite films were. And, and um, you know, again, at that time, you know, if you, 
it was one thing to be able to see like the killer or a better tomorrow, but if you'd seen like a better tomorrow two or once a thief, um, you know, that meant you were kind of hardcore. That meant you like had these like, weird mislabeled VHS tapes and stuff. And, and Adam immediately kind of started talking about, a, you know, bullet in the head, various cuts of bullet in the head. And, and I was like, oh, this is a guy who knows his weird esoteric action cinema. And, and you know, and that was really it. And uh, we, we just kind of stayed in touch. And, you know, the, the, and the three of us, I mean, that's the funny thing is I'm, off, I'm often asked just about Adam, but, you know, we're still friends with Evan. Um, we're still, you know, we still hang out with him all the time too. And he's still doing cool, st cool stuff too. Um, you know, it was just a very kind of fun night for the three of us to meet. Um, but yeah, it was really John Woo and then, and then all of our careers failing. <laughs> yeah, that, that helped too. That actually was the real bonding thing was that our careers failed after that. Yeah. Cause it's cause dead birds, it didn't do well and homesick didn't do well. And then no one wanted to hire any of us. And I was trying to get hired to do shit like, uh, toy, toy soldiers too like the lowest point in my career was I was trying to pitch for like toy soldiers too. And it turned out that like the guy who had even got it greenlit, like had accidentally, he'd been thinking of uh, red Dawn <laughs> um, and he'd gotten them confused. So he'd like pitched it at a meeting and, and like his boss was like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. But it turned out like the executive was thinking of red Dawn and it got them confused. So he's like, turns out this is like uh, some kids in a boarding school. And so I was pitching for like stuff like that, like the direct to video sequels to like these movies that like, I didn't really like very much to begin with and, and not getting hired because, you know, I, I'm sure I would have done a terrible job. I haven't thought about toy soldiers and God knows how long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish I honestly, if it wasn't for like, if it wasn't for like that, just being one of like the, the worst pitching experience, like like worst pitching experiences I've, I've ever had where like the executives were like literally nodding off in the room while I was like, desperately trying to pitch to like you know keep myself financially afloat it, it was really like that because that was just like the moment where I was like you know it, it's that feeling where you're like desperately trying to get hired for a job you don't even want really um you know and, and all this sounds like oh you know I'm like it's a ridiculous thing to complain about considering you know how and I've worked a lot of shitty jobs and I know that you know there's a lot worse things than writing toy soldiers too but it was one of these like it was just the realization that I wasn't going to make it going that route really <laughs> that I was not ever going to be like a four hire studio guy. And I just didn't have it in me. And, uh, you know, if I was going to succeed in the film industry at all, I kind of just had to work outside of it. Um, you know, and that was really, I think Adam was having the same epiphany around the same time because he was pitching for basically the same projects. He was pitching to direct them instead of write them, which is slightly more dignified in the industry, but not much. Um, and, you know, and so, yeah, we were just like, well, what can we, what can we do? You know, and that was really, that was kind of the real drive. It's not even so much anything else. It was just the sense that like, this was just a person who had to make movies like me and we didn't have any other options for like happiness or success. And so we were willing to do like desperate things uh, like make movies for no money. And uh, yeah, not a lot of people are willing to do that. And still to this day, that kind of guides us. I mean, like we just prioritize our work over almost everything in our lives, you know? This is kind of a non-linear tangent, but before we started recording, you were talking about how you're you're kind of into Zoom lifestyle and you like the you like that engagement style better. Have you been pitching more over Zoom, and do you think that it like makes you more comfortable that way? Well, the only thing I've pitched really over Zoom, and it's it's debatable how successful this was is is face off two and on one hand it's probably my most successful pitch ever in that it's the first time i think i've ever pitched anything and it did well but we pitched it for like a year and a half <laughs> and like and ultimately i think they hired adam and i to just like write a treatment for it initially because just to try to understand what we were talking about um because our pitches were so confusing and we were trying to like figure out how to get like visual references for them so people could just keep track of the characters and understand what we were talking about and that was when the studio finally like threw in the towel and was just like, look, we'll give you guys a little bit of money to just explain this on paper. Like, so, uh, so on one hand, my most successful pitch ever, I kept pitching and I kept pitching so badly that they were forced to hire me uh, to write something down so they could understand what my pitch had been. And then they were like, oh yeah, you should take this to script. Sounds I mean, we're going to save this to the end, but now that we're bringing up face off, uh, I mean, I have to ask, especially now that you've brought up the fact that he was he, he's such a revered filmmaker between you and Adam. How do you find the balance between making a face off movie that's your own, but maybe, you know, respecting the 90s action charm of the original? 
Well, I mean, you know, that's just it. I mean, I think, um, I think, uh, I think that's the challenge, um, you know, is, is to do that. I don't have an easy solution other than to be aware of the challenge with every creative choice you make. You know, you constantly have to be saying, is this face off? And is this what a fan of face off wants? And just because I'm a fan of face off and this is what I want, the Blair Witch lesson, doesn't mean it's the right choice because <laughs> sometimes I have weird instincts, but maybe that's good. So that's the, uh, that's, that's the process you have to make uh, with that. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's true. Films have changed uh, quite a lot since the face-off era um, where, you know, our blockbusters were essentially kind of R-rated films for adults, right? Like, you know, that's, that's very different now. You know, movies now, uh, you know, for a film to cost as much as face-off cost back then, it has to kind of not only appeal now to a wider age range, but more internationally which um, studios I think are still kind of wrapping their heads around uh, precisely what that means. And, you know, uh, I think our attitude is like, we don't want to second guess the audience or anything. You know, we just have a really <laughs> interesting, very specific idea of what a face-off sequel should be. But, you know, I mean, like, I don't think we'd make it if it's not R-rated, for example. Um, you know, there's certain things Adam's already kind of come out and said, like, like, I'm not doing it if it's not, you know, done a certain way. And one of those, you know, is I think like we would not, there's no version of Face Off 2 that's like a PG-13 film. So it's like certain things like that. It's like you have to, you can compromise on obviously certain things, but ultimately no one wants a PG-13 Face Off sequel, right? Like, but at a studio level, they might for some reason think that's not true because it might make them a lot more money if, you know, if kids for some reason are suddenly into Face Off, which they're not. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of have these like, you have to go with your gut a lot of times and just say like, like, you know, what is, what is the version of this film that would justify its existence is really what you're doing. You know, cause I'm, I understand why people are so cynical about remakes and sequels and, you know, and, you know, like if we had made our, I saw the devil, it would have forced every person to clarify which I saw the devil they're referring to in conversation forever. And, you know, that can be, you know, you can always be like, no, not the American one, the original Korean one. You know, that can, that can be annoying, especially if you, as a fan, have like a concrete, uh, like emotional relationship with these films. You know, obviously, you know, fan culture and this affects the horror genre less than most, I think, perhaps happily. But, you know, a lot of people's egos and self-identities are really tied up in their entertainment consumption. Um, these things are really linked to identity in a lot of ways, especially on the Internet. And, you know, you can say like, well, you're just consuming corporate entertainment. You shouldn't really like base your, your ego and identity around that. But whatever. I mean, I, I do it, <laughs> like we all do it, you know, like we're fans, you know, and, 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 and these are the things that shape us, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm as much influenced by the fictional characters in my life who I grew up with as a kid, you know, than like some of my teachers and stuff, because, you know, that was how I found my moral compass. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, like, you know, uh, that like Ash and the Evil Dead films is a great role model for a human being. You know, but it's like, that's the kind of stuff that like can, can, can have an impact on you. So if I, you know, for example, was going to make another Evil Dead film, there are a lot of people who are really going to be like, well, why, you know, how do you justify that? Like, how are you not just going to ruin this thing that is, a, you know, a personal thing for me? Um, face Off, you know, the good news about Face Off is it's not like anyone was going to make this movie. Like we, we, we pitched it. It's, it's our idea. Um, you know, it's not like anyone was going to make a different version of it. So, so, you know, we are approaching this with like a lot of creative love, but you do just have to trust yourself at a certain point, because I think if we second guess our creative choices too much, I think that's kind of what led us to Blair Witch, you know, was kind of thinking like, well, our weird choices are too weird and people don't like them. Uh, face off too. I think we have to say, you know, the, the first movie is born of all these incredible weird choices. And I mean, John Woo is the greatest, right? But like Face Off is to me as much John Travolta and Nicolas Cage and an amazing script, you know, that, as it is John Woo. It's, it's all these factors just came together and it's unclear moment to moment, who's kidding? You know, but it's the funniest movie ever made, but it never tells you a joke. It never wastes your time to laugh at what it's doing. And that to me is the beauty of 90s action and, and what we'd love to get back to. And if anything, I think, um, Perry, you kind of, touched on something that like uh, I, I, I try to specifically do in my own work, which is I like a lot of humor, but I don't like a lot of jokes. Um, I like things being funny, but I don't like wasting people's time uh, with like riffing or uh, 
uh, banter. <laughs> um, I say this having talked continuously for something like 17 minutes right now. But, uh, but, but Face Off is in some ways, I think, um, you know, there's a reason that movie is so important to Adam and me is because it, it kind of does symbolize our creative uh, ideology in a weird way, which is this movie that on one hand, it, you know, you could look at it and say like, that's the dumbest, silliest, biggest bloated action entertainment ever but it's doing some things that are really quite clever and brilliant, you know, and, and it's certainly nothing that movie is doing is easy. Um, and, you know, and so I think like, you know, there's an artistry in, in entertainment that I think sometimes gets overlooked. I think it's easy for critics to watch a film that's clearly not trying to be entertaining and give it the benefit of the doubt, you know, oh, maybe this is doing something artistic and I just missed it because it's clearly not trying to be fun. So I better, you know, give it at least a three and a half. Um, whereas if a movie is just trying to be entertaining and is bad, then you can kind of, you can kind of be like, oh, you're, you're, you're just a bad movie, aren't you? You're not trying to just, you're not trying to say anything that I might've missed. You know, maybe the fact that all my other critic friends, you know, gave you a good review, you know, doesn't matter. Um, you know, there, there's, there's other considerations if a movie is just trying to be silly, but if a movie is trying to be serious, then you might be like, well, everyone else like this, maybe I missed something. So, you know, with Face Off, you can love it or hate it. It's, it's obviously a ridiculous film, but I think there is something interesting about like entertainment as art that, that is sometimes overlooked because, you know, they, they, these things are kind of seen as divided in, I think, our film community. There's something that's like product for consumption and then it's entertainment or it's, or it's kind of, you know, more high-minded. And, you know, we try to blend these things with kind of corporate activism, which is a whole other topic. So. Generally, I just think that kind of is what should guide a good face-off sequel to bring it back is uh, don't waste people's time and entertain them. That's where I was going with all that, for sure. Well, I'm curious, you brought up your I Saw the Devil project, which you guys were on for a while, and it's another one of those films. Obviously, it's much more recent, but deeply beloved and celebrated. And I'm curious, like, when you're approaching these films that you love so much and you've you've talked uh with a very self-deprecating manner uh where do you find your like where do you find it in you to be like yeah I can pick up the mantle from John Woo I can remake I Saw the Devil yeah well you know that's a great question but uh because because you would you would you would assume there's a tension between those two things but that's that's what you just said is is the key to being a filmmaker which is you have to have 100 confidence with 0% self-satisfaction uh, to be a good filmmaker. Like every single time I have to be like, this is the best script I've ever written, nay, ever written. And, uh, and I'm gonna send this off and uh, surely my Oscar will be arriving shortly. And then as soon as it's off, I'm like, oh, well, you know, maybe the next one will be decent. <sighs> you know, and, and, and that's the process. It's, it's kind of like you have to have in the moment you're like, you almost have to have the project itself kind of tell you what it is and guide you. And just like in the moment you have to have the confidence to make decisions. I think the reason, um, you know, people love filmmakers like Claire Denis and David Lynch so much is because it feels like they're always operating from that instinctive space. It feels like they're always making choices from that space of like, I don't really know why this makes literal sense, but it makes sense on like an emotional abstract level and it does. And somehow you get it. And those are the kind of the choices as a director that you want to be finding. Um, so, you know, so you have to have total confidence in yourself. I, I genuinely have a lot of belief that I'm good at what I do and that I'm a talented filmmaker. I, there's a lot of evidence that not everyone agrees with me, though, and I would be really foolish to discount that. And, uh, and, and furthermore, you know, you just never be like patting yourselves on the back and celebrating because really what it is, success, all success buys you in the film industry, if, if you're very lucky, is the ability to make another film. And like the work is its own reward. And if the work isn't its reward for you, then you're doing this for the wrong reasons and you need to get absolutely out of my way and everyone else's way. Like, you know, um, and I'm sure I'm in a lot of people's way, you know? And so like, you know, and then that's it. It's like, if you don't like, like you have to love filmmaking, you can't just love this notion of being a filmmaker or whatever that is, you know? And, and I do love what I do. Like I love making movies and I love telling stories and I love, you know, the process and sound mixing and editing and setting up shots and lighting and stuff. I love all that. And I feel like I'm good at it, but you know, I, I would be totally stupid to, to not stop and just be like, Oh, I did everything wrong. Well, next time I'll do it. Great. Like, and that's how I feel about like seance is like, 
I did a commentary track for Seance where I really tried to specifically just talk about what I felt like what my mistakes were. I was a little high, so I don't think it's very good. But I couldn't think of anything else to do because I had to record it in my apartment by myself. And I knew it was going to be weird because I wouldn't have Adam with me. I should have made Evan or Adam come over and just be my moderator. But it was it was kind of during the midst of COVID and, and it seemed hard to arrange. So I just did it by myself. And uh, and I tried to make it like a like, hey, I'm not going to talk about like the things I did right and the things that went well. I'm going to focus on what I feel like I missed because um, I just thought that was kind of a more interesting approach because I don't hear directors do that. Like I was like. I messed this up. I should have. I should have got a close up there, you know. And and uh, you know. And I think that's the way to grow as an artist. So, you know, on one hand, you could say like, how do you have like the hubris to consider remaking something like I saw the Devil or doing a sequel to the Blair Witch Project or Face Off? But that's that's totally unrelated to my own insecurities as a human being. That's that's like my that's like as an artist. That's a whole different process. I don't even think about whether I'm good or not. I just think about like, oh. I actually do have a new version of I Saw the Devil that I could do. You know, in that case, like, you know, we kind of did reach out to Kim Ji-woon indirectly at an early stage and kind of got his blessing in particular to do something different with I Saw the Devil, um, which then subsequently we didn't make. So that was a real, that, that's how we dodged the bullet on that one. Um, you know, Blair Witch, uh, we, uh, we, you know, we plowed right into that uh, painting of the tunnel on the wall. But, you know, I mean, it, every film's different. And, you know, Face Off 2 happens, you know, I think at the end of the day, the fact that we're not remaking it, the fact that we're doing a sequel and the fact that we're approaching it with, you know, this true love of fans, you know, I think that does guide you in the right place, but you know, you can't pander to fans. You can't, it's a tricky thing. You can't second guess what you think people want. You, you really do just have to find those characters in the story and just hope that it guides you in the right place. I think I you know, I just ask about Blair Blair Witch. Wait, are you staying on this topic? Cause I gotta go to Blair Witch. <laughs> No, I just wanted, well, we were going the same direction. I just wanted oh. him to know that he's talking to two big Blair Witch defenders. So wait, jumping off of that, I, I have a I have a question about that because I, I really, I really do like that movie. And I think you both deserved a lot more credit than you got for it. But I was one of those people who had the luxury of seeing it at San Diego Comic-Con when it was called The Woods and nobody knew it was a Blair Witch movie. And I love the movie. And when I realized what it was, my mind was blown. I think that event had the intended effect on me. But do you think prematurely revealing that it was a Blair Witch movie kind of, you know, changed the expectations for the folks going into it on opening weekend? Well, I certainly don't feel like we did everything right. Uh, my, my dog's having an aneurysm. That'll, that'll definitely happen at least one more time. Um, yeah, well, I mean, okay. The the ultimate revelation of Blair Witch, which, you know, I could obviously unpack quite a lot. Um, but the short version is we made a film in secret that it turned out we made for about 300 people. Uh, you're one of them. Um, you know, like, like I think one of the last times I talked to you was actually when I was doing press for Blair Witch and uh, our friend John Schnepp, uh, rest in peace. Uh, he was also a big supporter of the film. And, you know, and and so hearing from people like yourself and, and, and John and, you know, people who, you know, I, I know creatively are, people I agree with and I think their opinions are cool. You know, it's easy to kind of, I think, get what that movie was trying to do if you know our sensibility and you're a horror fan in a specific way. Um, ultimately though, we're kind of hardcore people. Like, like, we, like there's a reason you do this show and it's because you watch like everything. Um, and I follow you, so I know you watch everything. And Ultimately, a lot of people were just sick of found footage. A lot of people did not like, like a lot of people still don't like the original Blair Witch Project and are still mad about it and they don't want a sequel. And all the people who do love the Blair Witch Project also didn't want a sequel and they have very complicated ver feelings about the previous one. So we were just like, we were kind of in this like little niche market of like people that wanted a very sincere sequel to the 1999 film, The Blair Witch Project. And because we made it in secret, we never stopped to ask if anyone liked this idea or wanted this or wanted or thought like what we were doing was a good idea. A lot of filmmakers talk very negatively about the process of audience testing in Hollywood. And obviously that's, um, that's because it can often be used to push an agenda, right? You know, it, it, we think of audience testing as the way movies are made, you know, are dumbed down and taken away from their creators. But audience testing is great because, you know, any director who doesn't, any director who doesn't want to know how people are going to react to their film I think is making a huge mistake. And I don't care if you think those people are smart or 
educated cinephiles or not, like they're, they're your audience. So Blair Witch is a film that if we had tested it at an early stage, conceptually, I think a lot of red flags would have come up and we would have realized, oh, people don't understand that we're not, for example, saying that we're directly showing the witch. And by the way, our credits are misleading, which we didn't realize either. So like, you know, so there was a lot of things about making a movie in secrecy that handicap you creatively in ways that you wouldn't perceive at the time because you're making a movie in secrecy and you're not talking to anyone else and everyone you're talking to has been working on Blair Witch for like the last several years. And you've started speaking basically your own weird language of references at that point. And so you don't ever think when you're like, I mean, there were time, there were, there was a moment specifically in the edit room for Blair Witch where I remember Adam cut something out of the movie and I was like, yeah, we should cut that. It's boring. And it was like this crucial little bit of information that then a bunch of people flagged as like a confusing thing. But we were just so bored of looking at it, you know, and we hadn't had any input from anyone else. So, you know, so that's, that's honestly like, I think the larger answer of how making that in secrecy, I think hurt the film is because we did not understand the, the feedback in advance of the audience that we're making the film for. You know, it's in hindsight, it's impossible to say what people wanted. The Woods, which is what Lionsgate was calling that film prior to calling it Blair Witch. I didn't like that title either because I could only think of the Lucky McKee movie. Um, and, and like, you know, I think a lot of people were hoping Adam and I were doing an original horror movie. And, you know, we didn't realize that. <laughs> like, we kind of looked at your next and the guest and, and what we perceived as their failure at the... Uh, and it's not our perception that they both failed at the box office. That's that's pretty much mathematical, uh, mathematically provable. Um, so we were looking at those as not things to be repeated or imitated. It was only kind of when I made, when I wrote Blair Witch and I realized that like, actually people did like the weird thing we were doing. They just didn't want to necessarily pay money to see it in theaters. But I was like, aha, seance. So I have... That was something I really wanted to ask about. The guest has had such an interesting journey from coming out being very beloved by a smaller audience, then being discovered years later on streaming and developing a much larger audience. What has it been like to have a, a project go through that? And I know Adam recently mentioned the possibility of a series. Is it still like this eight year old film still a living thing? You know, it is in a way. I mean, we are working on a, a another guest thing, uh, which is kind of all I'll say about that. But um, but like, you know, I, I don't I don't know. It's tricky. I think it's a huge mistake, actually, for filmmakers to make sequels to films that have developed an audience. And the reason for that is that I think you cannot exceed the expectations of what people are building up in their minds. Um, and, and you should realize how fortunate you are if you're a filmmaker and you have a cult success like The Guest. I mean, it's tremendously gratifying. I, I was actually just recently talking uh, with someone about The Guest and, and how specifically we didn't feel like that movie was any kind of success at the time, even critically. I know it, it was well reviewed in like a Rotten Tomatoes way, but none of those reviews, a lot of those reviews felt to us like the three out of fives like, 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 like critics kind of being like, eh, it's not too annoying, like positive, you know, but, 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 you know, no one was really saying like, oh, this is this like unique thing. And, and these filmmakers have, a, you know, a particularly strange sense of humor clearly. And, and, you know, and, uh, you know, no one was really identifying that until streaming when people were kind of like, oh, this is actually quite funny. Um, and, and, you know, it's great to have that happen. It's, it's incredibly gratifying. I, I actually would ideally skip the failure at the beginning um, and go straight to the success in the future if I could. Um, but, you know, better, better, you know, late than never, as, as they say. And, um, and to a certain extent, I think this is, and this is where I think you really need to be careful if you're in kind of the position that we're in, which is not to, you don't want to exploit or fetishize genuine fandom that's evolved in an organic, nice way, which is what we kind of have with the guest, which is, I think people like the guest more because they know it's a failure. In other words, I think we have pa the passionate fandom of fans who know that their fandom is unique. Um, I, I know, by the way, I'm aware, I'm well aware that people are somehow able to skip the cognitive dissonance and have that for like My Hero Academia and Marvel movies now. Nonetheless, there's a specific fandom, as you both know, to when you feel like you are the world's like kind of biggest fan of something, 
not everyone else likes it. Not everyone else knows what you're talking about. And when you recommend the guest to people, still probably 19 out of 20 of them are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then if you show it to them, you know, 19 out of 20 people will say, well, why have you wasted my time? Um, but that one out of 20 person is, is really quite passionate. And, and so that's what we have with the guest is, is, I think people like it more because you can go on like, you know, a box office website and be like, oh, wow, they're not joking. This was really quite a failure, um, you know, by any level of assessment. And, and, you know, and I think there's a feeling on Adams and my part that we want to, you know, give fans of the movie something. But I think at this point, like a guest sequel would just disappoint everyone because everyone has a different idea in their head of what that would be. Just like the Your Next sequel that we mistakenly kind of talked about when we were under the impression that people might want that to exist. You know, it, it's it's this notion where like, if we actually made that now, everyone would just be disappointed by the reality of it. Um, and then like 10 years later, someone would be like, oh, that wasn't so bad. And uh, ideally I'd like to stop doing that. But you know, I mean, the, the truth is I would never intentionally, you can't, you can't, you can't intentionally try to make a movie with a success you know, narrative like the guest, it, it, you really have to be, I think, a genuinely strange filmmaker, you know, like Adam and like myself and have a really strange idea that you mistakenly think is going to be a huge success, which is what we thought the guest was going to be. We thought this was like our, like, you know, like Hurt Locker times the Terminator times Halloween, you know, um, and, and, and you really have to make kind of a weird movie that, that people don't like at the time. And then like years later, it, it's a strange thing. I would never try to second guess it, but I do think, you know, we're very cautious about like, like there's a lot of people that are like, please make a guest sequel. And you have to like, you have to like, you want to just like take them and look them in the eye and just say, you don't actually want that. You'd be very annoyed with me if I did that. Cause I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do. I'm going to do something weird and annoying and you're going to be annoyed by it. Like it's not gonna have Dan in it if I make a guest sequel or he'll show up at the end and he'll be like working in a library or something. Cause like the character of David will have completely assimilated, assimilated correctly into society and is like perfectly happy now and is like running for mayor somewhere. And it would be like a totally unsatisfying film for me because the weird sensibility that led me to write the guest in the first place still guides all my creative decisions, which means, you know, when I work in that space, I think people aren't gonna like it. <laughs> Um, but we do have like this notion of, of kind of giving people more of something that they might enjoy um, in a way that hopefully doesn't feel like we're, you know, uh, exploiting any kind of fandom. With all that in mind, in terms of release success, how did you apply all those lessons learned to seance? And I, I guess day one, when you put pen to paper, so to speak, what were your intentions as far as how that movie was going to connect to the audience that you were eventually going to reach again? Uh, well, the the honest answer, and, and I'm dead serious, is I knew I probably wouldn't connect with audiences again, because I, I, I uh, so I knew I had to make the movie cheaper than The Guest, because <laughs> I knew that Your Next was perceived as being very successful, despite the fact that it also wasn't really welcomed by mainstream audiences, uh, but that's because we made it for a lot less than we made The Guest for. So I knew I kind of needed to be a little closer to Your Next than The Guest, and then I could get away with doing something weird again. Um, you know, I also, um, you know, I don't really think I'm a good horror writer or director. Um, I, I, I used to think I was good at it, but now I think I'm I'm not actually. And um, and this is because I just know I see so many people who are so much better at it than I am. Um, and 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 you know, I mean, I could name so many horror films that came out last year that like I was just like I wouldn't know how to do this. Um, you know, relic possessor. You know, I mean, there's like there's people who really know how to set up a scare, um, and 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 really, you know, get like take you to a different world. And and for me, like, well, possessor's sci-fi. That's that's different. I shouldn't compare myself to possessor. Brandon's on a different different wavelength uh, with his stuff. But um, but you know, it, it, I I don't think I I want to get back to that thought because I I don't think I'm a good horror filmmaker in like a traditional sense. I don't necessarily think I have good horror ideas. Uh, but I have a lot of love for the genre. And, and so with Seance, I kind of thought, you know, I should go for something that's more horror, horror adjacent. I should go for something that's more horror friendly than, uh, than The Guest, um, because The Guest is just this weird combination of genres. And I kind of thought, you know, if my foundation for Seance, obviously I'm gonna end up throwing a bunch of genres into this thing. I just can't help myself. Um, you know, Suki's in a Western, like everyone's in a different movie. 
Um, but, but, you know, like, like, but I knew the foundation, like, I was like, if, if my foundation is I take this kind of 90s slash revival and these giallos and stuff, and that, and that's like my foundation that feels commercial enough to me that I can get pretty weird on top of it. And, and that was kind of what I was thinking is I was like, well, if I write like more a girl's school, you know, slasher mystery, uh, you know, how, like, how bad can it be kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> was kind of what I was thinking. I was like, you know, it's, it, I can be fairly affordable and I can probably get fairly weird in that and, uh, you know, tell a different story with different approach to character. So that was really it. I, and, and I was like, and it'll be in a single location. And then uh, every school in Winnipeg told us to, to fuck off. And then I ended up having to film in a bunch of locations and I should have just written a movie that took place in a bunch of locations because that's what I ended up having to do. But, you know, and, you know, we had, and I mean, I knew, I knew I was going to have fewer shooting days to make seance than we had on your next or the guest, you know, cause I knew I was doing it union. I knew I was doing it in Winnipeg and I knew I had basically an ensemble cast of young actors of varying experience ranges. So I knew what my challenges were. Um, but I just figured if I made everyone look cool and, you know, and again, I just feel like, I just feel a lot of like, I've consumed so many slasher movies and ghost stories and Gialli that I just was like, I, I just don't feel like I can mess up too badly if, if this is the template I'm going for this time, but I'm never going to do that again. Cause, uh, cause I did think it was very difficult. It was much harder than I thought. And also like the, uh, you know, the, the thing that seance and your next and the guests do, which is this mysterious stranger slasher movie thing. That's loosely based on a John Hughes film is so specific that, that like, you really have to assume people don't want much more of it. So I think like seance, that's it. Done. Here in Winnipeg, this gave me a chill. That was probably one of the coldest shooting locations I think I've ever been in my entire life where I might oh, what, be really scarred. What, what, what brought you to Winnipeg? The, the set visit for the movie Run with Sarah Paulson, where ah, I, I, yes. stood, I stood outside for a good while at three o'clock in the morning. And I've, I've truly never felt cold like that before. Yeah, so we filmed a seance in November and December. Um, in Winnipeg. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've had the chance to see it, but like there's there's snowy exteriors in that movie that are like, like we had to rush to film them because pretty soon it, would, it was getting so cold that it would just stop snowing. Um, you know, pre precipitation stopped happening or whatever. Um, and that kind of is like the, you know, January, uh, February, March. And yeah, I mean, it was Jade Michael, um, who's in Hunter Hunter, I just watched. I like that movie. Um, but uh, she's in seance and there's a scene with her outdoors where she's reacting with her phone. It was the hardest scene to shoot in the film. It was pretty much the only time I had to like walk off set for a second for just like a minute. I was just like, Kareem, just like take care of this, like set this up. I just need a second. Cause I was just so like, I don't know if we're gonna make this movie. It was like, it was like the second week. And I was like, we're so behind like on everything. I and mean, we weren't behind the schedule, but like we weren't getting all the coverage I'd hoped for, of course. And Jade's out there with this phone and it's so cold. It was like, in terms of Fahrenheit, I think it was like five below zero or something, but you know, we were using Celsius. So I have no idea. I just knew it was like, you know, it was, it was her hands weren't working on the phone screen because her fingers were so cold and the phone was so cold. And like, and then we're putting her in this tent to warm her up and then taking her out instantly into the cold again. So she's like, you know, basically we're torturing her. And uh, that was when I was like, I, I, this is, this is a dark moment. And like, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and there's, there's one, I think it, I think I actually put it, hopefully LRA doesn't get mad at me about this. I think she had to prove it. LRA Smith who played a uh, Helena in the film. There's a, I ha there's one outtake that I put in like the deleted scenes for the, for the Blu-ray where she just like walks out and Suki gives her a line and she's just like, I'm sorry, I'm so cold. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> Cause she just like walked out of the building. It's them walking outdoors and she was just completely unprepared for just like what it feels like walking out into the Winnipeg cold at night, which is it feels like you're being dropped from about 20 feet straight into an icy lake. Like it knocks the breath out of you. Um, I'd walk out of uh, the apartments where Kareem and I and the crew were staying and you just, it would just feel like getting like punched in the gut. You're just like, you'd, you'd, su you'd, you'd suck in air because the feeling in your skin was so extreme and your lungs would instantly like freeze basically. So you're like coughing and hacking and like trying to, I mean, it was like, and then you're like, and you're like, and then people live here. I loved it. I loved it. I loved Winnipeg. I loved the vibe. I loved the fact that like this, the, the environment itself is just like absolutely determined to kill you. I love the cruise. I mean, I just love the energy there, but, uh, but yeah, it was awful. Um, I, think, I think Suki said it was like her favorite shoot ever because no one did anything on it. 
because like usually people are like socializing and hanging out and she's 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 like me she's you know she's a she's kind of strange introverted person and so like she i think like was totally down for just like like the the hanging out on sands which i could have told her like no one ever hangs out on any of our productions they're not fun i think if you're having fun making a movie i've never had fun making a movie and i'm not saying like it's wrong to have fun making a movie but if i ever did have fun making a movie i would seriously examine what was going on like i'd be like like am i doing this right or have i gotten complacent because you shouldn't be happy. You should be like trying to make everything perfect and it never is. And uh, you know, you should be freaking out and stress puking all the time, which is what I was doing every day. And that sounds, oh yeah, I mean, Kareem, <laughs> I, 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 for a while I was driving Kareem and I everywhere. And then Kareem actually had to talk to production and say like, like Simon is not safe to drive. Cause I was just like so stressed out. And I'd like, I'd like get up and be like walking to our car and I just like lean over and vomit. And then I'd be like, all right, we got to do it. But we just didn't have enough money or time to make this movie. And there was no safety net. You know, there's no contingency. Had an awesome line producer, Connie Hoy, some great people involved who, who helped make it work. But um, but yeah, I mean, like, like you know, when you're making these kind of miserable, tough films, um, you know, the circumstances are always going to be awful. Um, but yeah, filming win filming in winter in Winnipeg. <sighs> wow. I mean, but but then, but it looks great. But I will say, it looked, they, the actors look really cold on camera, which is what I kept saying to them. They're like, it's so cold. I'm like, yeah, but it looks great on camera. And and you know what? It does. It does. Because you can see their breath. You can see, like, their, you know, their faces are kind of flushed. You can see that it's real authentic cold that we're not, like, that we didn't just put a bunch of styrofoam in someone's front yard um, and, you know, and make them wear coats in, like, you know, the middle of the summer in Australia or something. Um, we We did it they're authentically unhappy and cold <laughs> in seance and but i mean I, I i i will finish that by saying that by the end i was convinced that the trick to beating the cold this is after i'd gone to mac, MAC and dropped like you know 500 bucks on new boots and stuff because i thought all my winter gear was like i was i thought i was so ready to go and then you get up to winnipeg you realize all your stuff sucks um and you need real winter clothes um but my trick was to just never get warm so I would just stand outside. Whenever we had exteriors, I would stand outside the whole time by, by myself uh, when people would have lunch and I would just pace and pace and pace to stay warm. Um, and uh, that was how we got through those uh, those shoots. Um, I, did, I felt bad for the actors because as soon as they would wrap or as soon as they would stop shooting, they'd rush them to this tent and put them in this hot tent. And I was just like, I was just like, don't go in the tent, stay out here with me. Um, but they didn't want to stay out here with me. They wanted to be warm. Joke's on them they probably felt colder in the long run. I feel like we got to let you go soon. Haley, do you want to throw anything seance wise in before we do, before we do our last two? Oh, me? Do we have Wait, Haley. No, Haley, you, you asked Haley if oh, she yeah. wanted to say something. Sorry. Do we have time for another question before we do our last two? Because I know we, we haven't gotten there. yelled at in the chat yet. I am that ready yes. to give someone <laughs> the opportunity to yell at us. I see um, nothing. Go for okay. it. Okay. Then we're good. Okay. Um, actually, mine's more of an industry question that I wanted to ask you because something else that you talked about in your Fantasia discussion was sort of like the the disappearing middle class of filmmaking, and you know we've lost a lot of the home video market, and now the theatrical market is declining. And I'm just curious um, what your take is on these last few weeks as we've seen people really returning to theaters um, in, an, in maybe more than I expected. Well, uh, well, first of all, I, I should say thank you so much for watching that. I really do appreciate it when people do any research at all prior to an interview. It makes things so much better because um, then, you, you know, it's not just the same kind of questions and, and we get to kind of leap to a real conversation. Um, you know, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not like an industry, industry prognosticator that anyone should take seriously, but, you know, I do, I, I think the thing that's interesting about theaters will be to see if people come back from movies that aren't Godzilla versus Kong, um, is there going to be a theatrical market for non-blockbusters? Um, the, the kind of nobodies of the world, which was filming actually in Winnipeg when we were doing seance, um, they left uh, while we were still filming. Um, but, um, you know, like, like movies like that and, and, and whether people are willing to see those in theaters, I don't know, you know, I mean, it, it's certainly the profitability of these films is getting smaller, you know, uh, during the DVD era, you know, anything that, you know, you could put a star on the cover of would make 15, 
20 million just in overseas disc sales for these studios. And, you know, and that led to very bad cinema by and large. When the profit margins get smaller, cinema, I think, gets better personally, because I think filmmakers are just kind of hungrier and, and more interesting. And, 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 the, and the, you know, the climate is just kind of more like, you know, it's more garnered towards films that are unique and actually good, you know, like word of mouth starts to matter more. I don't really know, you know, if people are going to come back to theaters in a major way. I certainly hope they do. I certainly will be, I'm, I'm already like, you know, seeing everything I can in theaters because um, I, I love doing it. But again, I know that I'm in, kind of in the, in the minority there. I think to me, the more interesting conversation is what's going to happen with streaming and particularly horror, uh, the horror genre when it comes to streaming, because we have Shudder and we have no one else. And I think with the bigger streaming services. Now, Hulu are, are willing to spend some money on horror. They're doing David Bruckner's Hellraiser reboot. That's exciting. But I think for the Netflixes, you know, especially after, you know, their kind of controversy with cuties and, and how that actually did affect their shareholder price, there's no incentive for these streaming services to make content that's in any way shocking or provocative. They're very de-incentivized to do it. In fact, their incentivization is, is to make fairly safe award stuff, regardless of whether or not people watch it, right? because that's kind of what gets the cultural conversation uh, in a way that helps their shareholder values. So that's kind of my concern is, is if the home video market, which is a relatively new thing in of course cinema history, but horror has always gone towards the grindhouses and the drive-ins and then the video stores. Um, so now we're looking at kind of a streaming marketplace, but it's one that to me excludes a lot of genre work that isn't just kind of hacky, uh, you know, action stuff. Um, because, because I think streaming services have no kind of incentive to, to create this kind of content. Now, of course, there are a lot of uh, films that, you know, defy that. I, I, I think the best reviewed horror from last year, His House was a Netflix movie. But, you know, again, that's a very political film in, in its context, at least. Um, and so, you know, so, so I think, I don't know. I, I think I'm curious to see, you know, who's going to be financing the next Martyrs um, you know, I, 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 I mean, that's French. So I guess French people will be financing it with their tax money and they can just examine that however they wish. Um, but you know, they actually have financing for the arts there. So I guess it's not a good example, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, I, I just don't know what the market is, you know, for, for streaming content that's in any way pushes the envelope in, you know, in terms of kind of content and the way that the horror genre has always been known for so that's something to think about because there's no real theatrical market for, you know, avant-garde horror unless it, A24 is putting it out really. Um, and I don't know what the streaming market is as well. So, you know, I'm a little interested in that and in, in the future of that, it, you know, our movies, you know, to get a theatrical window, do movies have to be these four quadrant blockbusters that appeal to, you know, everyone across the globe you know, and, you know, or are, you know, or is there, or is there going to be a market for the smaller kind of 10 to $20 million films that ultimately tend to be the movies that I like? Um, I, or am I going to be making movies for under, you know, $3 million for the rest of my career? Any one of these things is, would be actually wonderful. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I hope, I hope everything comes back. I hope, uh, I hope, um, I hope theaters come back, but, you know, I, I, I haven't seen, uh, you know, a lot of studios really pushing for that yet. So, you know, I guess hopefully this this interview will be, you know, an interesting kind of historical artifact, you know, to whatever the next step is for how we consume entertainment, which is probably gonna involve some chip in our eyes anyway, where you'll just like basically like look up into the left and just like your movies will play in your Rick retinas and, you know, and you'll just, you know, be kind of one with your computer anyway. So it'll just be a different process then. Hard to predict stuff, I guess. feels like I am. Yeah. All right. I did get the warning. We always end with the same two questions. Haley, I'll give you the honors first. Which would you like to choose? Well, one of them we got spoiled. Yeah. Usually asked, do you have any pets? I know that you do. Please tell me about your dog. Uh, I have a uh, neurotic, aggressive, ill-behaved rescue dog named Hazel, um, who has uh, bitten two humans, uh, myself and Adam Wingard. Um, both, both seriously enough that, you know, it, it, we were both unhappy. Um, uh, she, she, uh, we adopted her, um, uh, my partner and I, my, my girlfriend, Kelsey and I, who's probably trying to keep her quiet frantically right now, uh, adopted her 
almost two years ago when she was four, we went to like a little adoption place and, um, and she was really calm. And so I was like, this is great. That's what I want. I want a calm kind of older dog. She was a little overweight. I was like, okay, this is perfect. Um, she is calm, but she's crazy. And we can't let her around other dogs or other people. And we can't really leave her alone. And she's kind of ruined my life. But I love her very much. Hazel is a very good, she's a very good, very loving dog uh, when she's not biting you or uh, attacking other dogs. But I'm now one of those people who's constantly like apologizing neurotically for, you know, for their pet. I'm also like, hey, sorry, she's a rescue dog. Like, sorry, working on it. Um, she's gotten a lot better, you know, she's not, she's, you know, she's lost weight. She's a lot healthier. She's a lot happier now. Her tail wags and stuff. Um, and she clearly like loves being here with us, but she, um, but yeah, but it's, it's like way, way, way more time than I thought. And, uh, you know, and, but, uh, but yeah, Hazel, Hazel, uh, will surely, uh, you know, make an appearance in all my social media feeds shortly because, uh, she's a very photogenic dog and I just take photos of her, but she's great. I mean, I really wanted a rescue dog. I grew up in rescue dogs. My mom, uh, you know, to this day kind of runs a hospice for like, like abandoned poodles. She, she like, she used to her thing is she used to go to places and adopt like elderly poodles that like no one would want because they were in like decrepit health and kind of give them another couple of years. So I would, you know, come home and there'd be like three elderly, po like a poodle that would just like walk over and just lean against you because it didn't have like a hip. Like, <laughs> so I had to like lean on you and I'd be like, oh, who's this? And I'll be like, oh, that's, that's Rafa. He's probably not going to be with us much longer. I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, actually, this is a this is a true story. My mom waited to euthanize one of the dogs until Adam and I were making your necks because we were both staying in her house. Um, Adam had this horrible toothache and was taking dog morphine that my mom gave him, like these little dog morphine capsules that had helped her, like you know, take one of the dogs to the Rainbow Bridge, I guess, basically. Um, you know, and she always keeps these dogs like like you know, it's like it feels a little past the expiration date in some cases, you know, cause you don't want to let go. And, and it's the hardest thing of having a pet, right? They, they don't last forever. And I'm sure when Hazel gets old, I'm going to, you know, start looking into cloning and stuff and, you know, completely turn out to be a hypocrite. But like, I mean, you know, I see my mom like intravenously feeding pets and it's like, you know, the dog probably is kind of telling you it's natural life cycles over. But anyway, that's what I grew up around. And I always thought like giving rescue animals a home is the right thing to do. I didn't want to, you know, go to a, breeder or anything I wanted to get a troubled dog that needed a home and I got a troubled dog that needed a home and now is this complete like you know walking metaphor for all my own neuroses and anxieties and issues as a human your mom's a saint and she's lucky to have you I know it's a lot but it's worth it all right I have a feeling we're going to be forced to end this but I'm going to squeeze this last question in that I have a feeling you're going to have a lot of answers to we I'll always to ask real. our guests if they have any form any new piece of genre storytelling that they want to recommend to our viewership whether it's a new movie a show a book video game you name it you know I I I I, I actually um there's so many just bouncing out of my head right now um, but I'm just going to go with the first one uh, that comes to mind. I really loved uh, a film last year that I saw called Anything for Jackson, which was a low budget Canadian film uh, that's on Shutter, and and I thought it was so brilliant, and and I thought it was really I had an approach to horror storytelling that I thought was so good, which is essentially the protagonists are dabbling in Satanism and kind of get in over the head. They're dabbling in it for relatively altruistic reasons, ish. But, but it's, a, it's a brilliant approach to storytelling because it allows your protagonist, it gives you a reason why your protagonist would be in a scary situation. And then the scary situation unfolds and it's super low budget, uh, but it, you know, uh, totally creative. Um, and then I'm gonna squeeze another one in because just because I haven't come out yet, I like shouting out movies that haven't come out. There's a, there's a public movie coming out called Frank and Zed, um, kind of in the Meet the Feebles style. I got to see it, I think through Nightstream or possibly Fantasia. I thought it was great. Um, so keep an eye out for Frank and Zed. I don't have any involvement in it. I don't know anyone involved. I just thought it was one of the best movies I saw last year and it's going completely under people's radar. It's a kind of Frankenstein retelling uh, with puppets, but it's really gory. Again, and that kind of meet the feebles. Um, I, I, I wish I could think of another example, but really that's kind of it for puppet horror, isn't it? Anyway, Frank and Zed and anything for Jackson would be my two recommendations for horror fans. Anything but Jackson, we are big fans. Frank and Zed is going on the list. 
All right. Yeah, this- yeah, yeah. You'll dig it. <laughs> we got to let you go. So I'm going to give everybody a reminder. Simon's new movie, Seance, it's going to be available May 21st. And you have the option of seeing it in theaters, on demand, digital. Check it out. Simon, congratulations. It is always a delight to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. 